uh, to the spring workshop of the Edinburgh Women in Philosophy group, but this has become like an annual event that has been going on now for a few years, thanks to the initiative and enthusiasm of our Edinburgh Women in Philosophy group. So I'm very, very grateful to the people that made this event possible, such as Natalie, G, Zhao, Julie, Anna, Jonathan Antonio, that really put a lot of time and effort in organizing this event. Um, we are delighted to combine uh, this year spring workshop uh, with the visit of Janet Kurani from University of Notre Dame. Janet will be here at IASH for a week as a distinguished visiting fellow coming uh, under the um, support of the IASH International Research Group on Philosophy of the Natural and Human Sciences. And uh, we are delighted and thrilled to have her here. I mean, Janet doesn't need an introduction. She's a, um, a world-leading expert on uh, philosophy of science and in particular on the feminist approaches in philosophy of science. So she has extensively published in the field, so she just to mention a few books, Philosophy of Science after Feminism, Oxford University Press 2010, The Challenge of Social and Pressure of Practice, Science and Values Revisited, University of Pittsburgh 2008, The Gender of Science, Feminist Philosophies, and so on and so forth. So the plan for today is, is to uh, have a master class in the morning on uh, Janet's most recent work on agnotology or the social construction of ignorance, followed by the proper workshop with uh, papers and Janet's paper at the end of the day. So we'll kick off with Janet's master class, which is really meant to be um, not like a second talk in the day, but more <laughs> like an introduction and mapping the ground on the topic of agnotology and ignorance. Uh, a topic that has been at the center of a lot of attention in contemporary philosophy of science and, 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 and beyond. And so Janet has done some really interesting work in this area, and so it's a great pleasure to have her here today to introduce us to acknowledgement and advance. So, thank you, Janet. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be for especially for Michaela for inviting me and all those other people whom she mentioned uh, who have emailed me or planned in other ways and have made me feel very welcome. So um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Michaela said, let me, uh, I'm going to read a few things to help you understand where agnotology is and where it's going and maybe where it needs to go. Um, Although many today speak of ours as a knowledge society, ignorance seems to flourish all around us, even in the United States. And I'm going to use the example of the United States, where ignorance especially flourishes, um, not so in Europe. But I hope that we will, in our discussion, uh, make comparisons. So, but the United States is the place I know best, of course. So even in the United States, considered one of the most advanced of societies, Millions question some of the most established results of science, such as evolution, global warming, and the benefits of childhood immunization, while they fail to question other results, such as many of the claims about the safety and effectiveness of drugs offered by the pharmaceutical industry. What's more, only a small fraction, less than one-sixth, of the information gathered in the US each year is even made public. The rest is kept secret by industry and government. And the information that is made public often varies in content depending on the sources consulted. And the problem, they, many say, is getting worse. As a result, within the last 10 years, historian of science Robert Proctor has been promoting a new area of inquiry. Proctor calls it agnotology, the study of ignorance which he suggests is of as much relevance to philosophers and scientists and others as it is to historians. And Proctor has been alone in this uh, in enterprise. Um, other, uh, other historians, such as feminist historian Londa Schiebinger and historian of science Peter Gallison and Naomi Oreskes and many others have been involved as well. Indeed, the suggestion is that agnotology offers a new approach to the study of knowledge, an approach at least as important as its more established philosophical systems, epistemology and philosophy of science. According to this new approach, ignorance is far more complex than previously thought. Ignorance is not just the void that precedes knowledge, 
or the privation that results when attention focuses elsewhere. It is also, in fact, it is especially something socially constructed. The confusion produced, for example, when special interests block <coughs> access to information or even create misinformation. Thus, Proctor has written about the tobacco industry and the techniques it used in the past and continues to use to produce doubt in the public regarding the health risks of smoking. Oreskes and co-author Eric Conway have written about the small group of politically conservative scientists who work behind the scenes to install, in, install public, to stall public recognition of such problems as acid rain, the ozone hole, and global warming. Gallison has written about the development of the U.S. government's procedures and motivations for keeping vast quantities of information secret, classified, and the problems that have arisen both inside and outside government as a result, and so on. These are wonderful, path-breaking historical studies that surely exemplify an expanded understanding of ignorance. But do they also exemplify a new area of inquiry, agnotology, on a par with other areas, such as epistemology and philosophy of science? And if they do, what relation might the new area bear to these other areas, to epistemology, whose focus is on knowledge rather than ignorance, and to philosophy of science, whose focus is on the knowledge of scientists, not the ignorance of the public? What might agnotology contribute to philosophy? And what might philosophy contribute back? These will be my questions. Start with the understanding of ignorance provided by philosophy. At least in modern times, philosophy has provided a very expansive conception of ignorance. Human ignorance, of course, refers to what humans fail to know. And for much of the modern philosophical tradition, this ignorance has been thought to be, or at least it has been feared to be, nearly boundless. Epistemology in the past, for example, um, very much followed in the footsteps of Descartes, and much of it still does. And, but while Descartes never thought that his evil demon had gotten the better of him, his followers have certainly thought otherwise. Indeed, neither Descartes nor any of the epistemologists after him has ever been granted a clear victory over the kinds of skeptical doubts raised by Descartes. And New York University epistemologist Peter Unger, in his now classic and highly influential book, Ignorance, has argued with great cogency that no one ever will be granted that victory. According to Unger, in fact, no one knows anything at all. And hence, no one will ever be justified or reasonable in believing anything at all as well. Knowledge and rationality are simply not to be had. The story from traditional philosophy of science has been similar. There, Hume has been the hero rather than Descartes, I think. Hume was someone you all know here. And Hume's problem of induction can lead to what might be called a problem of abduction, or inference to the best explanation, has taken the place of Descartes' demon. And although scientific realists have tried frightfully hard to justify scientists' claims to know in the face of these and related challenges, once again, none has finally been granted the prize. As a result, some of the most learned figures in philosophy of science such as Karl Popper, have candidly admitted that scientific ignorance is our fate. Neither theories nor even basic statements, accepted by convention, are ever justified. And even when the learned are not quite that candid, the result seems the same. Think, for example, of Thomas Kuhn, for whom the march of science is a movement away from primitive beginnings, but not toward anything at all certainly not toward any fixed end set by nature. Or think of Bas van Fressen, for whom in induction but not abduction is reasonable. For him, therefore, observation statements and empirical laws are knowable, but theories are not, even though for him observation statements and empirical laws are theory-laden with those same unknowable theories. 
So prominent traditions in both epistemology and philosophy of science have emphasized the paucity of human knowledge and the vastness of human ignorance. Of course, there have always been problems with these stories. For one thing, their standards for knowledge have been unreasonably high. Involving, as they do what Dewey would call, a misguided quest for certainty. Perhaps because of this, no one has ever really believed these stories, even with all the arguments given in their defense. At least no one has ever acted as though they did. Unger, for example, after his book was written, continued to give his talks and publish his papers and teach his classes, even though he claimed to know nothing at all. And Popper, I dare say, never worried over the consequences of doing the things he did, even though he claimed to have no grounds for any particular expectations. And this points out the fact that there never has been an appropriate response to the traditional stories. At least these stories never called for any response, never demanded any remedy for the ignorance they described. How could they, when their arguments called into question even the bodies that would be needed for a response? You know, they caught him wonder whether he was there, whether he had a body, and <coughs> Unger worries the same and said, had no idea, etc. No matter. The upshot is that knowledge for epistemologists and philosophers, and philosophers of science has seemed a difficult achievement, perhaps an impossible achievement, and at any rate, one that needs to be explained, to be justified, while ignorance is perfectly natural. Agnotologists seem to be offering the opposite story. According to this new story, knowledge is frequently what is natural, and ignorance is frequently what needs to be explained. Think, for example, of the tobacco study of Proctor and the global warming study of Orestes and Conway. Cigarettes are surely har harmful. That is uncontroversial. In fact, has been uncontroversial for more than 50 years. They have been linked not only to lung cancer, but also to heart disease, and strokes, and emphysema, and diabetes, and a host of other diseases. And they kill six million people per year, more than all the world's infectious diseases combined. Proctor calls them the deadliest artifacts in the history of human civilization. Indeed, if all smoking were to cease tomorrow, the extraordinary death rate from smoking would still remain in effect for decades. Yet the belief continues to be widespread that smoking is safe, or at least is safer than it used to be, or at least is safe enough to be acceptable, at least for a while, that it is an adult choice that connotes freedom and independence and sophistication that it is wonderfully, a wonderfully relaxing pastime, and so on. And so cigarettes continue to be the most widely used drugs in the world, with six trillion cigarettes sold every year. Global warming has also been uncontroversial for years. If no measures are taken to deal with it, the rise in global surface temperature could be as high as 11 degrees Fahrenheit during this century. And the longer we wait to deal with it, the worse the outcome will be. Yet the general public continues to doubt that global warming is occurring. According to Pew Research Center surveys conducted in <coughs> February, March, and August of last year, for example, only 61% of Americans believe global warming is occurring, and only 40% believe it is human caused. And in other countries, the situation is even worse. Indeed, a 2007-2008 Gallup poll has, um, that surveyed people in 128 countries found that over a third of the world's per population has never even heard of global warming. As a result, serious action has been delayed. With all the information readily available about the hazards of smoking and the dangers of global warming, what needs explaining here is the enduring ignorance of so many in the face of all this information. For agnotologists then, unlike for epistemologists and philosophers of science, knowledge is frequently what would be natural, and ignorance is frequently what needs to be explained. 
What's more, agnotologists go on to explain that ignorance, and their explanations tend centrally to involve science. In his 2011 book, Golden Holocaust, for example, Proctor explains how in the 1950s, when the evidence for the link between smoking and lung cancer had become overwhelming, the tobacco industry opted to fight science with science, and that was their slogan, to fight science with science, in order to forestall regulation and protect profits. The industry devised a set of strategies called by Proctor the tobacco strategies to do this. Strategies that included funding decoy research to distract from critical questions, thereby so-called jamming the scientific airwaves, organizing friendly research, so-called, for publication in popular magazines, establishing, that is to say, friendly to the tobacco industry, establishing scientific front <coughs> organizations, producing divergent interpretations of evidence, and even misinterpretations, and even suppressions of evidence, forever calling for more research and more evidence, and setting standards for proof so high that nothing could ever satisfy them, and exploiting or actually producing divergent expert opinion. In addition, Proctor's earlier book, Cancer Wars, that came out in 1995, explains how trade associations were later organized to pursue some of the same strategies to shield still other industries from regulation and loss of profits. Trade associations such as the Polystyrene Packaging Council, the Fertilizer, Fertilizer Institute, the Chemical Manufacturers Association, the National Dairy Council, and the American Meat Institute. Other books that have appeared since Cancer Wars have produced additional details regarding the methods these industries have developed to produce ignorance in the public. For example, salt, sugar, fat, how the food giants hooked us uh, which came out in 2013 by Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter Michael Moss explains the strategies the food in industry has used to manipulate the public into ever less healthy food choices to generate ever more profits for the industry. And many of the food industry companies that he refers to are owned by tobacco giants uh, such as R.J. Reynolds and Philip Mars, so it's all connected. For their part, Oreskes and Conway, in their 2010 book, Merchants of Doubt, explain how four distinguished scientists, Fred Seiss, past president of the National Academy of Sciences and past president of the Rockefeller University, Robert Jastrow, founding director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, William Nirenberg, past director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and Fred Singer, first director of the National Weather Satellite Center and founder of the Science and Environment Policy Project in his home state of Virginia, Oreskes and Conway explain how these four distinguished scientists adopted the same tobacco strategies to produce doubt and confusion in the American public regarding not only global warming, but also other serious problems such as acid rain and the ozone hole. In each case, these scientists worked against a strong consensus within the international scientific community by such tactics as misrepresenting, suppressing, or attacking the results of scientific studies that supported the consensus positions, lodging personal attacks against scientists whose research was central to the development of the consensus positions, defending competing but weaker positions than the ones accepted, and in general, acting to create the impression that controversy still surrounds issues that the international scientific community considers settled. This time, the motivation, Oreskes and Conway tell us, was not so much the safeguarding of profits as an anti-regulation, market fundamentalist set of political commitments. Still, the activities of Seiss and the others were backed by major conservative think tanks that were in turn backed by the US fossil fuel industry, particularly ExxonMobil. The upshot is that science has been a central player in the production of the American public's ignorance, 
even while it has been a central player in the production of the knowledge that the public is lacking. What's more, it has been very difficult for the public and even sometimes for the experts to distinguish when science is producing the one and when it is producing the other. But this suggests, but this suggests some answers to the questions with which we began. For although agnotologists accept, indeed presuppose, that science produces knowledge, the knowledge of the harms caused by smoking, for example, or the knowledge of global climate change, or the knowledge of the elements of a healthy diet, agnotologists have largely failed to explain what constitutes these results of science as knowledge. Oreskes and Conway, for example, have portrayed science's peer review system and the mechanisms it employs to generate scientific consensus as hallmarks of the production of genuine knowledge. At the same time, Proctor has challenged this account, emphasizing how economic and political interests have helped to shape these mechanisms, emphasizing how, for example, the tobacco industry has organized conferences, established journals, supported certain lines of research, while criticizing or even suppressing other lines of research, and so on. As a result, these peer review mechanisms are essential to the production of ignorance as they are to the production of knowledge. Ironically, Oreskes and Conway have also challenged their account of knowledge with their many examples of how tobacco industry strategies have been put to use in a variety of other non-tobacco related contexts. Meanwhile, none of these individuals has offered a more adequate account of scientific knowledge even though the distinction between such knowledge and the socially constructed ignorance on which they focus is central to their project. Of course, what constitutes knowledge, scientific or otherwise, is just what philosophy has traditionally attempted to explain. If it has so often failed in the attempt, that may be because its methods of analysis have largely lacked the constraints on, science, on philosophical imaginings that real-life, socially important questions about knowledge and ignorance provide. But these constraints are just what the questions of agnotology now provide. In short, the way to achieve success in both enterprises, in the knowledge-focused inquiries of philosophy, epistemology and philosophy of science, as well as in the ignorance-focused inquiries of agnotology, may be to combine the resources and needs of both into a new, more inclusive area of inquiry that adequately deals with knowledge and ignorance. Perhaps it should be called agnoepistemology. Mm -hmm. But active construction is not the only way in which science produces ignorance. Proctor also calls our attention to science's passive construction of ignorance. That is, to the ignorance that scientists produce as an unintended byproduct of their research. As he puts it, inquiry is always selective, and research not selected at any particular time is not just research delayed, it may be research lost forever. Proctor does not specify the various ways in which such ignorance might come about, but examples come readily to mind. There is first the ignorance that results from organizing scientific communities in particular ways. Think, for example, of the knowledge that was lost to anthropology from such traditional contributors as travelers, merchants, soldiers, missionaries, and local intelligentsia. Um, when these now amateur, so-called, were excluded from anthropology in the process of its professionalization. Similar losses have accompanied the professionalization of many other scientific disciplines. Or think of the knowledge that is now being lost through US government constraints on various international scientific collaborations, and even on the acceptance of graduate or postdoctoral science students from particular countries. This type of ignorance, so these examples are examples of it, this type of ignorance as passive construction might be called community-based ignorance. There is second, the ignorance that results from directing research in particular ways rather than other ways. Defining AIDS as a biomedical problem of how to deal with AIDS virus 
rather than a public health problem, of how to deal with those suffering from HIV AIDS, for example, left hidden for decades the socioeconomic, cultural, and globalization aspects of the AIDS epidemic, and as a result has precluded a timely solution to that epidemic. Again, the continuing focus in health research on disease management and biochemical processes leaves hidden how health and disease are produced by people's daily lives, access to medical care, economic standing, and relations to their community and thus blocks important avenues of disease prevention. So all this type of ignorance as passive construction might be called research direction-based ignorance. There is third, the ignorance that results from operating in particular conceptual or methodological or technological spaces. For example, historians and philosophers of science, as well as scientists, have detailed the confusions that continue to arise among lay people and even among scientists themselves from a set of concepts that derives from the late 19th century. A set of concepts that includes nature, nurture, gene, environment, heredity, heritability, and inheritance. Foremost among the confusions is the nature-nurture debate and the persistent disputes regarding the roles played by genes and the environment in determining individual traits and behavior. This type of ignorance as passive construction might be called conceptual or methodological or technological system-based ignorance. Doubtless, there are other forms of ignorance as passive construction that arise from the conduct of science. But there is also at least one more category of ignorance that arises as well that Proctor calls virtuous ignorance. This is the ignorance that results when not knowing is deliberately accepted in research as a consequence of adopting particular values. It arises, for example, when knowledge would be gotten by improper means, involving, for example, serious risks to human subjects, or when knowledge would compromise the right to privacy, or when knowledge would be too dangerous to pursue, such as a know-how involved with certain kinds of biological or chemical weapons. And all this is just the beginning. As Proctor says, and this is a quote, access to all kinds of information is limited for more reasons than the moon has craters, unquote. But these additional categories of <clears throat> ignorance construction by science, ignorance as passive construction, and virtuous ignorance reveal still further connections between agnotology and the knowledge focused enterprises of epistemology and philosophy of science. <clears throat> to see this, consider again the three forms of passive ignorance construction described above, but this time consider them in conjunction with one subject, and given the focus of our conference, let that subject be women. Consider first community-based ignorance and how it relates to women. Women have been involved with science right from the start. In ancient Egypt, for example, we know that many women worked as doctors and surgeons, but we also have information about women chemists and chemical engineers in the perfume industry in Babylon, and women botanists in Caria, and women physicists, philosophers in Crete, and women marine zoologists in Assos, and so on. And of course, we know of prominent women scientists in the Middle Ages, as well as the modern era. At various times and places in history, however, and especially during and after the scientific revolution, women were closed out of science, or were at least pushed very much to the sidelines. And the consequence was the loss of the knowledge they had achieved, and also might have achieved. Consider the health sciences, for example. Feminist historians of science, such as Londa Schiebinger, tell us that women, as midwives, held a monopoly over birthing information and procedures, as well as other kinds of information and practices related to reproduction and women's health care, until the 17th century. As late as uh, 1600, Schiebinger reports, 200 contraceptive and abortion methods, both medicinal and mechanical in nature, were commonly used. 
There is also evidence that Kauai does interrupt this abortion and infanticide regulated population in the 17th century. But all that changed by the time men consolidated their hold over what became known as the profession of obstetrics and gynecology. Modern medicine, Schiebinger says, did not achieve a knowledge of fertility control comparable to that practiced by women in early modern Europe until the last third of the 19th century. And as for the knowledge possessed and applied by women themselves in particular, the loss was even more serious. With the demise of the midwife and rise of the male expert, women had more children and, under and understood less about it than they ever had before. A similar story has been told about medical cookery, whose concern was the prevention as well as treatment of disease by diet, and whose subject matter was initially not clearly distinguished from other medical fields of the times, such as chemistry or botany. Although the invention of both medicine and cooking was traditionally associated with women, women never dominated medical cookery as they had midwifery. Still, women made substantial contributions to the field. Books of medical cookery provided essential information regarding medical care until well into the 18th century, at the time when chemists prescribed sometimes harmful or expensive medicines, and physicians refused to treat the poor. And women wrote many of these books. And even in the case of the medical um, cookery books written by men, Many of them simply made public women's oral traditions in an age when basic literacy was largely denied to women. Nevertheless, as in the case of midwifery, women were gradually closed out of medical cookery as it was transformed into, from a trade into a profession, in this case, pharmacy. By the 1750s, medical recipes had been dropped from cookbooks and by the 1770s, medicine had lost its connection with nutrition. The modern health-related sciences of medicine, pharmacy, and botany had become distinct from each other and from anything developed or practiced by women. And as before, the development and practices that women did contribute, and also might have contributed if given the opportunities to do so, were lost. When we turn from community-based ignorance to the other forms of passive ignorance construction previously described, that is research direction-based ignorance and conceptual or methodological or technological system-based ignorance, the situation is still more unsettling. Indeed, a veritable army of feminist researchers, feminist scientists and philosophers of science and historians of science associated with such fields as biology and psychology and anthropology and archaeology and medical research and economics and political science and sociology, to name a few. This veritable army of feminist researchers has exposed the ignorance concerning women that has been constructed and is still being constructed by science. The problem in feminist economist Julie Nelson's words is that science, and this is a quote, science has been socially constructed to conform to a particular image of masculinity, unquote. That is, the conceptual systems adopted in science revolve around males as a standard or focus of inquiry, or privilege males or masculinity in some other way. And as a result, research concerning women, or females in general, is made difficult, if not impossible, to pursue and therefore tends not to be pursued. The result, in short, is gaping, jaw-dropping ignorance regarding women. Consider, for example, Nelson's own field of economics. The central concept in current mainstream economics, neoclassical economics, is that of the market, a place where rational, autonomous, self-interested agents with stable preferences interact for the purposes of exchange. These agents may be individual persons or collectives of various kinds, such as corporations, labor unions, and governments. The agents in either case exchange goods and services, with money facilitating the trans transactions. 
And the tool of choice for analyzing these transactions is mathematics. Indeed, high status is assigned in economics to formal mathematical models of these transactions. All this, perhaps, sounds innocent enough. What makes this conceptual system of current mainstream economics in, quote, image of masculinity, unquote, however, is that the agents, even the collective agents such as corporations and labor unions, are assumed to act just like men to be always rational, autonomous, and self-interested. That is, they are assumed to act the way men are supposed to act by the norms of masculinity. In contrast to the emotional, social, other-directed way women are supposed to act by the norms of femininity. Moreover, these agents' activities, their exchanges of goods and services, are understood to be part of the public sphere, facil facilitated as they are by money, and described in the language of mathematics. And this sharply contrasts with all those exchanges of goods and services in the private sphere that women are expected to engage in. In the ones facilitated by emotional attachments rather than money, and for which a kind of description more subjective than the language of mathematics is thought to be appropriate. The most definitive way the conceptual system of current mainstream economics shows itself to be an image of masculinity, however, is that it has failed so abysmally to give an account of women. Take women's experiences in the family. Since the focus in mainstream economics is on the public sphere, private collectives such as the family tend to get scant attention. And since the prototype for economic agents as individual persons, and masculine persons at that, when families are attended to, they are most commonly treated as if they were individuals themselves, with all their internal workings a black box. Or they are treated as if they have a dominant head, who makes all the decisions in accordance with his own, perhaps altruistic, preferences. Either way of treating the family, of course, leaves women invisible as agents in their own right in the family. More recently, however, families have been treated by some economists as cooperative or non-cooperative collective decision-making partnerships. But since here, as elsewhere in mainstream economics, the focus is on simplified mathematical models portraying the interactions of rational autonomous agents these collective decision-making partnerships end by being models of marital couples. Children, not yet fully rational, certainly not autonomous, and threatening to the tractability of the models, are either conceptualized as consumption goods or not conceptualized at all. Left invisible, therefore, are women in the family as caregivers, as agents who historically have borne the bulk of the responsibility for the nurturance and education of children and the care of the sick and elderly. The upshot is that women's needs and priorities in families are left invisible, that is, ignorance of women. The scene in many other scientific fields is similar. Consider for a second, and just one more example, political science. Here the central concept in both descriptive and normative inquiry is power. Quote, the abilities, and this is one version, very vague abstract version, the abilities of social agents to affect the world in some way or other. Though this concept, unquote, though this concept is interpreted in different ways by different theorists. So they all agree on just a very vague um, statement. The four main modes of interpretation currently available are the voluntarist conception stemming from the social contract tradition, the hermeneutic conception stemming from German phenomenology, the structuralist conception stemming from the work of Marx and Durkheim, and the more recent post-structuralist conception stemming from the work of Michel Foucault. Each of these interpretive, interpretive frameworks offers not only an elaboration of the concept of power, but also conception of human nature and the nature of social life. And yet each in the process manages to produce ignorance of women. Perhaps the most egregious case is a voluntarist conception. Initially put forward by Hobbes, 
This conception ties power to the voluntary intentions and strategies of individuals who seek to promote their own interests. And since the obstacles to be overcome frequently include the wills of other individuals, the voluntarist conception has been construed within political science as a capacity to get others to do what they would not otherwise do. What is involved in the modern conception, according to political scientist Jeffrey Isaac, is still well described by Hobbes and later by Hume because their, their formulations make explicit what is only implicit in more recent accounts, that the voluntarist conception of power presupposes an atomistic view of social relations and a human account of causation. That is, individuals are envisioned rather like the atoms of a gas, and the scarce resources within their social world are envisioned rather like the confined space of the container that houses the gas. Hence the conflicts experienced by individuals, that is the collisions of the atoms. Power here is nothing more than empirical causation, interpreted a la Hume. The ability simply to alter the path of another. Understood in this way, the voluntarist conception uh, the voluntarist conceptual system within political science, no less than the conceptual system in place within mainstream economics, exemplifies an image of masculinity. For again, individuals are portrayed as autonomous and self-interested. Again, they are portrayed as behaving in the ways men are expected to behave. And again, the resources of the system fail abysmally to provide an account of women. The recent work of feminist political scientists has documented this last point. For example, investigations comparing the legislative and leadership styles of men and women suggest that women pursue cooperative strategies, legislative strategies, while men prefer competitive zero-sum tactics. This is not what the mainline economists are describing. And women are more oriented toward consensus, so no bombardments of the atoms consensus preferring less hierarchical, more participatory, more participatory and more collaborative approaches than their male counterparts. And these and other investigations, feminist political scientist Mary Hawksworth concludes, make explicit, and this is her term, the model of abstract masculinity offered by the voluntarist conceptual system. The sciences such as uh, the science has produced ignorance of women in at least two ways. First, it has excluded or marginalized women scientists, scientists who in the past, and sometimes even now, bring with them different questions or perspectives or methods or, con or kinds of information to projects relevant to women. And second, science has adopted conceptual systems that describe, and they've only described conceptual systems, they are technological systems, and their methodological system, so this is a vast terrain. Science has adopted conceptual systems that describe the social world and sometimes even the natural world in masculine terms. This is the image of, of masculinity. And that as a consequence, direct inquirers toward research projects that illuminate men's situations, if they illuminate anything at all, and frequently they don't even illuminate men's situations, while they leave women's situations in the dark. But science produces the ignorance of women in other ways as well. For example, by adopting conceptual systems that incorporate a male standard against which females are judged and found wanting. Um, this has happened, for example, in psychology and biology. Doubtless, there are also other ways in which science produces the ignorance of women. What needs analysis in all these cases, then, is exactly what the knowledge would look like that would replace all this ignorance. So this, in a nutshell, is what philosophy can contribute to agno-epistemology.